Revelation chapter 2 is where we'll be reading this morning. We are looking at the letters to the seven churches. And we have gotten to the church at Smyrna, which starts at verse 8. So we'll be reading verses 8 through 11 this morning. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Let's take a minute and pray, and then we'll see what the message God has for us today. Father, again, we just come before your word in submitting ourselves to your authority. Lord, we know that all scripture is given by inspiration from you and is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness for us to learn from and be changed and to be challenged in our lives. And so as we look at this passage today, I pray that you would bring out the things that are important for each one of us. Help us to pay attention, as you've said, if we have an ear, to let us hear what you are saying to each one of us. And Lord, we just ask that your spirit would do his work in us as your word is brought forth. Lord, use me to speak your message. I pray that you would give me strength of voice, that you would give me strength of body and wisdom of mind so that I might speak your truth, that we might hear from you. Lord, just use me and fill me with your spirit so that your work might be accomplished this morning and your message might be preached. Lord, we thank you that you are here, that you are working in us and among us, and we pray that you would be glorified during this time. And so we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> All right, as I said, we've been, we started last week going through the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2. Last week we looked at the, uh, the church at Ephesus. And even though they had all these commendations that Christ gave them, he said the big thing, the fatal flaw, was that you have lost your first love. And if we look at history, it was that loss of love for God, or that walking away from love for God, that actually caused the church at Ephesus to have their candlestick removed. It no longer exists. And I mentioned last week that there's no church in Ephesus there's not even a city. Basically, it's just rubble. It's, it's ruins. You can go visit that area today. And we move now to the second church in the list. This is the church at Smyrna. Now, let me give you some background about Smyrna because it'll help you understand a little bit about what Jesus Christ is telling them here. And I want you to remember, these are messages to these churches that come directly from Christ. This is not even... You know, John writing necessarily under the inspiration of the script of, of the Holy Spirit. This is a vision that John receives directly from Christ. So these are the words of Christ to these churches. And, and it carries great weight and great significance, not just for these people, but for us as well. So as we understand these churches and understand the problems that they had or the things that they faced and the things that Christ told them, it helps us to understand what we should be, not only as a church, but as individual believers. And that's why he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. All of us need to listen. So let me give you an introduction to Smyrna. Smyrna was a city, it was a big city actually, that was in eastern Turkey. Uh, back then it was called Asia Minor. This is about 35 miles north of Ephesus. Ephesus was a major port city since it basically has become nothing. Smyrna was actually uh, in existence a thousand years before the time of Christ. 
uh, was founded as a Greek colony, and then 400 years, or about 600 AD or so, it was destroyed by uh, marauding invaders, and then it sat dormant for 400 years until Alexander the Great came and relayed the foundation of the city. And in between 316 and 281 BC, two men, Antigonus and then Lysimachus, they came in and rebuilt the city, enlarged it, fortified it, and from then on it just thrived and grew. So by the time that John is writing about this city and to this city in Smyrna, it has about 100,000 or more people in it. It's a great city, a great port city. And actually it became one of the most populous cities of the time, probably the second biggest in Asia Minor of the time. Now it still exists today. Today it's called Izmir, it's in eastern Turkey. And it has a population of about 2.8 million people. In the middle of Izmir, you can go and still find the remains of this original city that existed as Smyrna. Okay? So, at this point, it was one of the most beautiful cities in all of Asia Minor. And there were three cities, Ephesus, and then Smyrna, and then Pergamum. They kind of stand in a line going from south to north. And those were all coastal cities, and they competed all the time for the title of the greatest city or the crown jewel of Asia Minor. Per, uh, Smyrna was probably, at least in their mind, at the top of that list. They thought they were the best. They wanted to be the best. They wanted to excel in everything. Uh, the, the city was actually planned very well. It had very well laid out streets. And right down the middle of it, they had a street that was called the Street of Gold. And it was uh, mostly paved streets with very beautiful buildings. It was noted for its art, its education, its philosophy, its science, its medicine even. And there, there was a large library. So it wasn't just this little out-of-the-way town. This was a major cultural center of the area, okay? Um, it was situated on a slope. If you went there and looked at, at Smyrna, you can do this in Izmir today. It comes right down to the coast of the Aegean Sea. It's a beautiful coastline. There's a beautiful port that comes inland for several miles and then reaches out into the sea. And then from that... Uh, port from the, the, the uh, seaside there, it kind of gently slopes up and then goes up to the top of a hill. And all along that hill, that city is built up. And as you stand in the middle of the city and then look up the hill in the time of John, what you would have seen is on the hillside it would have been covered with temples and museums and beautiful buildings. And then at the top of the hill, there was built an amphitheater that housed up to 20,000 people. So it was a beautiful sight. And if you stood at the bottom and looked up, you could see kind of this sweeping uh, scope of buildings and temples and then the amphitheater at the top. And then right at the ridge of the hill, there was a set of beautiful buildings that people said actually looked like a crown. In fact, one poet compared Smyrna to a statue of the mother goddess Cybele with her feet on the seas and her head crowned with a circle of beautiful buildings. So this was an incredible place to visit. And in fact, they actually had a lot of tourism and a lot of people coming and going through the city. So at any one time, there could be a, a upwards of 200,000 people there um, coming and going and, and living and doing work. Now, Smyrna was also an important business center of the city. Right in the middle of the city center, there was a large two-level marketplace called the Agora. You can still go and see the remains today. It was built on great arches and it had great pillars set up on the second story. And in all of those little causeways between the arches and pillars, they had booths and uh, places where people could conduct business. And on the main floor, there were 28 main businesses that operated. Um, and then on the upper floor, obviously, you had the scenery, but then other businesses operated there. So it was a great place to be. I mean, honestly, it was a very popular city. People loved living there. And it was a port city. Their harbor is still very active today in the, in the city of Izmir, which used to be Smyrna. Ephesus, on the other hand, their port 
used to be very busy in the time of John. That actually has been filled in with sediment and silt. There's no longer a port where Ephesus stood. There's no longer a city, as I said. So the city of Ephesus is gone, whereas the city of Smyrna still thrives and flourishes in, under the name of Ephesus. Um, Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, and Cybele all had temples dedicated to their honor there. So it was a major center of religion as well. In fact, Smyrna was the first city to actually build a temple to the goddess Roma and the spirit of Rome. And it was very um, loyal to the Roman Empire. Um, they were never conquered by Rome. They actually just voluntarily came in under Roman Empire but because they voluntarily came in under the, the Roman authority, they were basically free to operate as they would as long as they gave their tribute to Rome and as long as they upheld the emperor as a god and worshipped him. And that they did wholeheartedly. So this is the, the, the uh, situation that we find here in Smyrna. Um, this is the city that we're talking about. It was a real city. It still exists, as I mentioned. A very beautiful city, kind of the top of the list, the place that you would put on a bucket list if you wanted to visit the great places of the world at this time. Now, we have no record in, his, in history or in scripture of when this church started. We don't know. There, there's no record of the church being started in this time. Many scholars believe that it might have been started during the time when Paul spent three years at Ephesus. While he was there, he was obviously teaching in the, in the church at Ephesus, but he probably reached out into the neighboring areas and started churches or witnessed to people who began churches in these areas. And so the church of Smyrna very well could have been a byproduct of Paul's ministry in this area. Remember, John the Apostle also lived in Ephesus for well over 30 years, and his ministry reached out into the area. So John, we know, actually was very influential not only in the church of Smyrna, but in other churches in this area. We know there was at least one synagogue in Smyrna during Paul's ministry, and remember, Paul specifically would go to the synagogue in each city as he goes into a new city to start his, his work there. He would join in the worship of the synagogue. They would read the scriptures together, which Paul was in total agreement with. They had the same Bible at this time. They would say prayers to the same God, and then Paul would take opportunity to say, well, you know, we're going to talk about God. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. And then he would introduce the gospel to them in the synagogues and start to teach there. So this was uh, Paul's ministry, and he very well may have started this church himself. There's still a church standing in Smyrna or in Izmir, not necessarily that was built during this time. It was built around 600 B.C. and it's called the Basilica of St. Paul the Apostle. I'm sorry, of St. John the Apostle. So we know that John had a great influence in this church, even though it wasn't his home church. We know that there was a church here because otherwise Christ would not be writing this letter to them and giving them this message. That's about all we know, except what Christ tells us about this church. So with that background of where this church is situated in the city of Smyrna, and the little we know about this church, Christ gives this letter to them in verse 8. And he presents himself to the church at Smyrna with two phrases here that I want to point out as he introduces himself as the Lord of the church. Remember, as we looked at Ephesus last week, Christ said, I am the one who holds the stars, the seven stars in my right hand. It is he who is the control of the church as well as he who protects the church. Here, he introduces himself in verse 8, and he says, And unto the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and last, which was dead and is alive. Now, there's a reason why Christ describes himself with these different phrases to each individual church. Each of these phrases or descriptions of Christ fits some of the characteristics or some of the problems that are going on in this church. Now, the church at Smyrna is not ever condemned in this letter. Christ never says, hey, there's some problems here. It's all commendation. But as he gives his introduction to himself, he starts by saying, These things saith the first and last. 
Now remember, I told you Smyrna was among the top three cities in the, in the region. They were always competing. They always wanted to be first. And in fact, Smyrna had inscribed on its coins the claim of the first city of Asia in size and beauty. So it was this atmosphere of wanting to always be at the top, the leading edge of everything, and we want to be recognized as the best. And in this city, to this church, in this atmosphere, Christ said, I am the first and the last. It's not about people. It's not about cities. It's not about empires. I am the first and the last. I am the one where the focus should be. I am the one who controls, who, who created, who sustains everything. And so Christ identifies himself to this church as the first and the last. Now, really, no city, no church, no government, no person can claim the honor of being first as far as the first in preeminence. That honor belo belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ. And here, this is exactly what he's saying. I am at the center of everything. It's not about a city. It's not about a church. It's not about even about you people. It's about me. And so he says, I am the first and the last. So here Christ is reminding his church in this city that he is the head of all things, regardless of what other people may claim otherwise. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, remember he said in, in chapter 1. The beginning and the end. It's all about him. And then he says, the one who was dead and is alive. Now, I gave you a little history of this, of this city that this church exists in. And remember, it was founded a thousand years before Christ. And then it was destroyed. And for 400 years, it sat dormant. Nothing was there. And then Alexander the Great came in and started rebuilding it. And then it was rebuilt by the two architects that made it a great city. And now it's thriving. So in a sense, this city had been resurrected from the dead. And yet Christ takes the focus off the city, off the environment, and even the people. And he says, I was dead, but I am alive. And so we have a great picture in the city of the Lord that's speaking here. Now, there's another reason, a more important reason, why Christ addressed himself as I am alive, or I, I was dead and am alive now. He, remember, this is just a quote, and he's quoting himself from chapter 1, verse 18, when he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. This is the ever living Christ. He was dead physically in his body, but he was completely alive. He still is completely alive. And he's reminding the church, even though this city may have died and been resurrected, I am the embodiment of true resurrection here and true life. I died on earth and yet I live now. And in this letter that he's going to write, he gives them the substance of their hope in that phrase, that I was dead but am alive. See, that's the hope of anybody who's saved. If Christ didn't come back from the dead, Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. We have no hope. Because you can't have eternal life in a dead Savior. And so the fact that Jesus Christ proclaims himself here to be alive to this church is an encouragement to them. It gives them hope in their salvation. And when we, as we look at their circumstances, you're going to see they needed all the encouragement and hope that they could get. So Christ presents himself here, the first and the last, I was alive, I'm sorry, I was dead and am alive. And then he con commends the church. Here's the, the con not condemnation, but commendation, the good things. He gives them a positive review in a sense. And he starts and he says in verse 9, I know thy works, thy tribulation, and thy poverty. Now, just the two words that begin this phrase is a comfort and should be a comfort to us because Jesus is reminding them, I know everything about you. I know everything you're going through. I'm not sitting somewhere up in heaven aloof to what's happening on earth. Remember, he is the Christ that stands in the middle of the churches. He walks among the churches, as he says at the beginning of chapter 2. And here he says, I know 
everything that you're going through. I know it. It's not that I'm not aware of it. I know exactly what's happening here and who you are and what you're doing and what's going on in your lives. And so there's a great comfort here. And he says, I know, first of all, thy works. Now, if you don't have King James Bible, you probably don't have these words, thy works, in there. It's the Greek word ergon. The reason is that the King James uses uh, or translated manuscripts that were later on than some of the earlier manuscripts. And the later manuscripts add this word works Whereas the earlier manuscripts don't. It just says in the earlier manuscripts, I know thy tribulation, and it goes on from there. So this phrase, thy work, shows up in King James, but it doesn't change the meaning of what Christ is saying here. He's saying, I know what's going on in your life. I know you're working hard in the church and in your Christian lives. But he says, I also know your situation that you're trying to accomplish this in. And that's why he says, I know thy tribulation. Now, the word for tribulation here is thlipsis in the Greek. The meaning of it is pressure or great pressure, literally under a crushing weight. It was used many times in secular uh, literature to describe the process of someone stepping on grapes to crush them so the juice would come out. That was the picture of the tribulation that this church was under. They were being crushed. And we're going to see a little bit of that as we go through this. So Jesus says, I know the crushing pressure, the crushing tribulation that you're under. Now, he doesn't specify the tribulation that they're currently experiencing here. But if we look in history, we know there was extreme persecution to the church and there's three reasons why that happened. Number one, the Roman government didn't like Christians. The Roman government considered them to be atheists because they worshipped a God they couldn't see. And they wouldn't worship the Roman gods or the emperor. That was a problem. And if you weren't going to worship the emperor, then you were a traitor. And therefore, you were subject to be put in prison or to be killed. Everyone at this point was required to pledge loyalty to Caesar and proclaim that Caesar was Lord at least once a year publicly. If you did not do that, then you would be imprisoned or killed. And the main ways of killing people at this point were either throwing them to wild beasts, mainly lions, and being torn apart alive, or being burned at the stake. They also, on occasion, crucified people, as Christ was crucified. But Christians mainly suffered both the lions or the stake. It got to the point in the Roman Empire where, and we don't know if this was the case at this point, but you had to be certified in that you pledged allegiance to Caesar. You would go and have to burn incense in a temple publicly and sign your name to a certificate, and then you would take that certificate, and that certificate then allowed you to present yourself to do business in the city and within the Roman government. Without that certificate, you were not allowed to do business. You could not hold a job. You could not make transactions or hold property. So when we talk about this persecution that Christians were under, that Christ says, I know your persecution, I know the tribulation you're going under, this is the, the type of persecution they were experiencing at this time. So it was from the Roman government. It also came from just the surrounding community. As I mentioned, there were many temples in Smyrna. The, the pagan worship was just overwhelming. And if you weren't part of that pagan worship, then you were an outsider. Now, the, the heathens and the Gentiles at this point didn't care which god you worshipped as long as it was, was one of these secular heathen gods that was accepted by the Roman government and by the culture. So you could pick your favorite god, and as long as you were faithful to that god, everybody was like, yeah, we're good with you. But again, Christians worshipped a god you couldn't see. And for them, that was atheism. It was like, you've you got to have something there that you can worship, an idol, something. And Christians wouldn't do that. Jews wouldn't either. And so the culture around them became very antagonistic toward the church. And the church was surrounded by this pagan worship. 
Now, we're going to see if you keep reading in verse 9. He says, I know thy works, thy tribulation and poverty, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So not only were they being persecuted by the Roman government, as well as the society around them, but also the Jews were completely against the church and the Christians as well. Now, the church and the Jews were very closely related at first. For the first several years or several decades of the church's existence, remember, many Christians were Jews. They continued to worship in the synagogue on Saturday on the Sabbath. They continued to practice most, if not all, of the Law of Moses. The difference was they accepted Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah. And so he was their savior. But as this uh, conflict between the Jews and the Christians started to get worse and worse, and the difference in this perception of who Jesus was became the center of focus, then the Jews started to really hate the Christians. And unfortunately, as you get into the second and third centuries, you see that that hate was reciprocated toward the Jews by the Christians. There's many church leaders, including Martin Luther and uh, others who wrote just absolutely anti-Semitic uh, views and opinions that the Jews were cursed, they were completely thrown out of God's plan, they were done, they would never be anything. They called them dogs. But that's how the Jews perceived Christians at this point. And so the Jews were doing everything they could to disrupt the church and to destroy Christians' lives. So they're receiving this persecution from every angle. Everywhere they went, no matter what they were trying to do, the, the Christians were being persecuted. And he says, I know your poverty. Because of this persecution, they couldn't hold jobs. They couldn't have money. They couldn't have property. They had everything taken away from them. And this word poverty is not just, you know, we're below the poverty level. When we think of poverty today in our world, and even in our country, most people in our country who are considered to be in poverty are rich people compared to many other places in the world. This word poverty is tokaya in the Greek. It means absolute beggary. They have nothing. Literally, the clothes on their back, and sometimes not even that. They beg just for food. They have no place to live. Many of them were homeless, and they were just going door to door to find a place to sleep every night. They were reduced to nothing. That's this word, poverty. And Jesus says, I know your persecution, the trouble that you're going through, and I know how desperate your poverty is, that you have nothing, literally, to, to rely on. But it's interesting, in parentheses, he says, but thou art rich. Even though you have nothing, Jesus says, thou art rich. Now, Jesus taught when he was on earth in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Lay up not for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, but where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These people physically had nothing, and yet Jesus says, You have the greatest riches that can be had on this earth. Because you are part of the family of God. You have all of the riches that come in being in Christ Jesus. In Romans 3, 11, Paul talks about this. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So Jesus is telling them, you have the true riches. You may be suffering. You may be absolutely destitute on this earth. But you have found that which is truly riches in the sense of you have received true life, you are part of Christ, and as part of the church, you will receive all the blessings that come in Jesus Christ, no matter what your physical conditions look like. So, so Jesus says you are rich. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know, the psalmist says, the Lord is my portion. 
In Lamentations, you read about Jeremiah's lamentation. In the middle of that, he says, God's mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And then he says, the Lord is my portion. That same phrase. He is all I need. You know, Wednesday we were talking about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the suffering that they had to go through in being thrown into the fiery furnace. And yet it didn't turn out to be suffering. It may have looked daunting before they entered. But as they went into the fiery furnace, if you know the story... God spared them. God was with them personally. And, you know, as our family was talking about this, the point came out, in the middle of that fire, nobody could touch them. Because nobody else could go in there. So in the presence of God, they had everything they needed. And that's what Jesus is saying here to them. Because you are abiding in Christ, you are rich. You have everything you need. If our wealth is not measured, I'm sorry, our wealth is not measured by what we have, but by who we have. If we have Jesus Christ, we have everything. But without him, we have nothing, no matter how much riches we can accumulate on this earth. So if we have Jesus Christ, we are truly rich indeed, even if we have nothing on this earth. And that's the message that Jesus gives to these people. And it's the same message we need to understand. Our riches, our treasure is not measured by what we can see. All of the stuff or what our bank account says. Our treasure is measured by whether we are in Jesus Christ. And if we are in him, we have everything. There's nothing else we can add to that. And that's the message of Jesus to these people. You're suffering, you're destitute, but you are rich. He talks about the Jews and the persecution from the Jews at the end of verse 9. Them which say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. He talks about this blasphemy, and the Jews were blaspheming him in two ways. Number one, they were blaspheming God because they had completely rejected the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. They denied him as a systemic fault. It ran all throughout Judaism from the top down. In fact, the Pharisees and other leaders of the Jews basically proclaimed that no Jew who would be considered a Jew would accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It was basically a hard and fast rule. This is how we will live. This is the company policy. You will not do otherwise. And so if you proclaim Jesus as Messiah, you are no longer a Jew to them. But Paul says, there are Jews who are not really Jews. In uh, Romans chapter 2, Paul refers to this and he says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. In other words, just because you are a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't make you a true Jew. You may be one nationally and racially, but you're not what God considers to be a true Hebrew or a true Jew. He says, he goes on in Romans 2, 28 and 29, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Jesus echoes this phrase that, that uh, Paul uses in Romans chapter 2. These Jews who blaspheme God, who call themselves Jews, but they're not really true Jews in the sense that God is their God. They've chosen their own way. And as they blaspheme God, they attribute all the works of God to Satan. That's what they did with Christ. Remember when Christ was being tried, they basically said, are you the son of God? And he said, you said it. But they said, and, and in his life, as he was healing and doing miracles, they, they basically said, you're doing the work of Satan. And that's when Christ said, no, a house cannot stand divided against itself. I can't be doing the work of Satan and give God the glory here. This has to be the work of God. But the Jews blasphemed God in rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And in fact, they blasphemed the church as well because they were making things up and accusing the church and Christians of things that weren't true. Going so far as to say that as believers partook of the Lord's Supper... They would go to Rome and say these Christians are having these love feasts and they're eating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So they're literally engaging in cannibalism. 
And that's what they accused the Christian church of to the Roman Empire. See, when Christ talks about this blaspheming, they're blaspheming God, but they're also bringing reproach upon the church and lying about them to try to accuse them before worldly authorities. So these Jews may be following the religion of the Jews, or at least to the Pharisees, but really they didn't care about serving God at all. They were completely against God's purpose on this earth. And that's why Jesus calls them, at the end of verse 9, the synagogue of Satan. They were literally carrying out the work of Satan and trying to tear apart God's church. So God, or Christ, tells them, I know this. I know your situation. I know you're poor. I know you're being persecuted. I know who's persecuting you and where it's coming from and how bad it is. And then he gives them this counsel in verse 10. He says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now, is that what in our minds would be the best counsel for somebody who's struggling? They have nothing. They've lost everything. They're sick. Think of a modern-day Job. What would you say to him? In Christ's first words to people like that is, don't be afraid of what you're going to suffer. You'd be like, what? There's more? I have to go through more? Isn't this bad enough, God? And Jesus says, fear not those things which you are suffering and those things which you are going to suffer. Remember when John fell in fear, prostrate before the, this vision of Christ, and Christ walked up to him and put his hand on him. What were the first words that he said to John? Fear not. See, those two words are the greatest comfort that we can have as believers. Because if we believe Jesus is in, in, in control of our lives and everything that's going on around us, we have nothing to be afraid of. And so he says, fear not, but he says, fear not those things which you will suffer, those things that are going to happen in the future. And he looks at, look at the specifics of the suffering that he tells them is going to happen. He says, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So fear not this suffering that's going to happen, because some of you are going to go to prison. Now, if somebody came into our church and said, I have a word from the Lord I have to give to you, and he said, I don't want you to be afraid, but some of you are going to go to jail because you're Christians. I mean, is that comforting? Not necessarily. But buried in this, fear not, is the fact that Jesus is there. He already said he knows our situation. He knows all of the things that we struggle with and that we go through, especially the persecution that we receive as Christians, which we don't get much at all in our modern day. Nothing compared to what these people were suffering. And if he came and said, fear not, but you're going to go through a whole lot more, I still don't want you to be afraid. And some of you are going to go to jail. And he goes on at the end, he says, be thou faithful unto death. Some of you are going to die. Now in our human nature, we go, I don't want to die. I don't want to go to jail. And it causes us fear. But understanding that in persecution, that fire of persecution is what purifies us. It's what brings us closer to God because as we are stripped of everything else that we can hold on to in this life, all we have left is God to hold on to. And unfortunately, that many times becomes our last resort when we've lost everything, when we've tried everything else. Well, let's try holding on to God. That's the only security we really have, and that should be our first response to persecution and trial. And that's why Jesus says, fear not. You don't have anything to be afraid of. And fear not that you're going to suffer. But look at where this suffering is come, got, comes from. He says, fear none of those things, verse 10, which shalt, thou shalt suffer. Behold, who? Who does he say will cast them into prison? The devil. It's not people we need to be afraid of. It's not circumstances we need to be afraid of. In fact, it's not even Satan that we need to be afraid of. We need to be aware of him. We need to be on guard against him, but we have no need to fear him. 
But he's behind all of this because it's his work, it's his purpose to destroy the church of God and to destroy everything that God wants to do in believers' lives. And it's important for us, as it was for them, to know that it's not mankind that is at the root of this suffering. It's not mankind that's perpetuating evil. It's not our society or our government that is promoting an evil agenda and calling evil good and good evil. It is Satan at work here. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul reminds us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our enemy is not government or people. Our enemy is Satan. And we have to remember that. And he reminds them of this. All of his persecution, all of his trial, all of this suffering that you're going through comes from the hand of Satan, not from people. Now you go back to the church at Ephesus. Remember their problem? They lost their first love. And when they lost their love for God, they stopped loving people. And Christ's commandment to us was to love everyone, even our enemies. And when we remember that the evil being perpetuated against us does not come directly from the people involved. It's Satan working through them to try to bring us down and destroy our faith. It becomes a lot easier to love the people even though they're perpetuating evil. Because really, they're just tools being used in the hands of Satan. They need God to deliver them from that bondage. And in loving them, that's how we see them in God's eyes. They're not our enemies. There are people being used by Satan against us, and they need to be freed by the power of God. But Jesus reminds them here, he says, this is all going to come from Satan. The Roman government, the society around you, the culture that's against you, even the Jews who proclaim to love God, they are nothing but instruments in Satan's hands being used to tear down the church of God and try to destroy your faith. He says you're going to be cast into prison to be tried. It was going to happen. Some were actually going to go to prison. Some did. We know that, but through historical records. And he says you're to be tried. Now, obviously, to be tried in a court that was unfairly going to accuse them of being believers in a true God, but also to try their faith. They're going to be tested. Their faith is going to be tested here. They're going to go to prison, and that's going to test whether their faith is genuine or not. He says, you shall have tribulation ten days. This phrase has been debated about its true meaning. And commentators have come up with several ways to look at this. It could be ten actual days of Roman officials coming to imprison people. Not that they would stay in jail for ten days, but that there was a ten-day period where Romans would come in and actively try to drag Christians out of their houses and out of the church and put them in jail. There was also, it could be referring to a short period of time in its completeness. Ten representing a number of completeness. Okay? So it could be a time of tribulation that's going to be completed in a short time. It also could refer to 10 specific edicts that were issued by the Roman government from this point over the next 200 years that were targeted specifically at Christians to die, try to destroy the church and drag them away from God to get them to pledge loyalty to Caesar and the empire. And if you go through history, there were 10 specific edicts that the Roman government issued against Christians at different points in history. We don't know exactly what this phrase is talking about, the 10 days. It could just be 10 days of persecution. Regardless of what it's talking about, I think the message behind it is this. When we look at persecution in the scope of eternity, it's really just a short time. I mean, even if we suffer for our entire lives from the time that we're born to the time that we die, in the scope of eternity, it's really just a short time. It's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction, remember the life Paul lived and the persecution he went through, and he calls it light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You're going to suffer, Christ says. It's just going to be for a little time. And I want you to persevere. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. And Christ is making the point here that the suffering and affliction of this life is very short-lived in comparison, not just to the eternal glory that Christians will enjoy in heaven, and so it's worth it, but the suffering of unbelievers is very small and very short compared to the eternal suffering in hell that they will go through. If our destination is not heaven, then this is the best life you're ever going to get. Because it's just going to get worse from here. But if we are in Christ Jesus and our faith is in Him, this is the worst of life we're ever going to experience and the best is yet to come. And so it's all worth it. No matter what we have to go through for a little time now, we have so much better to look forward to. When we talk about the return of Christ and looking forward to not waking up with pain in our joints, you know, being able to walk without tottering and falling against the wall, not having to wear these so we will be able to see perfectly. Those are things to look forward to. But above all of that, we'll be in the presence personally of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that is guaranteed to those who believe. And so what we have to go through on this earth is nothing. No matter how bad it gets, it's nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that we look forward to. And that's why Jesus says, fear not. You don't have to be afraid. The psalmist understood this in Psalm 56. He says, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. He's asking these people, he's telling this church and he's telling us, there's nothing to be afraid of. No matter how bad the persecution will get, no matter how bad, even if they kill you, you have nothing to fear. Because if you're trusting me, if you're truly a child of God, at the end of this life, when they take your life, you literally will be ushered into the presence of God in heaven forever with no more problems that you ever have to worry about after that. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. He repeats that sentiment in Psalm 118.6. He says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I think that verse right there, if I had to pick a life first, that's it. That's a great claim for believers. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Nothing. They cannot take my salvation away because it's secure in Jesus Christ. They cannot take away the blessings that I find in Jesus Christ because they're secure in Him. No person can remove me from His hand or from His love. So we have nothing to fear that man can do unto us. In fact, Matthew 5, at the, at the, the, uh, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. In the Hebrew, that's interpreted literally to jump up and down praising God with joy. Now, put yourself getting this letter from Jesus Christ and knowing some of the, the things that he taught, specifically this phrase from the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you're going to go to prison and some of you are going to die. Would your response to be, woohoo, yes, I can't wait. But that's exactly what he says to do in Matthew chapter 5. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets they before you. We are going to suffer as Christians. Christ is just reaffirming that for him, but he says, in the middle of suffering, don't be afraid. 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 3.14, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Happy about suffering. And he goes on, Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. 
We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And he says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jesus says, don't be afraid of the suffering, of the persecution, of all the trial that's going to happen to you. And it is going to come. He told him exactly what was going to happen. And he says, don't be afraid. History tells us some Christians did die for their faith. We know that. Open Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read those stories. People who stood for their faith and died for their faith. And yet history also tells us there were many Christians who were part of the church who relented. They didn't want to die. They were afraid, and so they gave in. They, they gave the emperor lip service. They compromised their faith so that they could save their lives. See, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of being persecuted for my sake. We have no reason to fear persecution. And the question is not if it's going to come. The question is when it's going to come and how much. And the message is the same for us today as it is for them. How much will we have to endure for him? At the end of verse 10, he says, be faithful how long? Unto death. Unto death. Are you ready to die for your faith? Jesus said, don't be afraid. Be faithful unto death. Persevere through the persecution, the suffering, even if you die in the process. Don't be afraid, trust me. Be faithful. That's the message of Jesus Christ to this church and to us. There's a fact about Smyrna I didn't tell you yet. The name of Smyrna, Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. It was actually one of the chief products that was produced in this region. Myrrh is an aromatic spice. It's produced from the resin of the myrrh tree or the myrrh bush. It's the sap. You probably have seen pine trees if they get cut or if a branch breaks off and the resin seeps out. The myrrh is the same way. Okay, but it's a very strong, sweet-smelling fragrance. And so the people would collect this sap of the myrrh bush, and then they would dry it out, and they could sell it in a block. But it was used to make a very expensive perfume. Or it was also used to embalm dead bodies. Now you remember, myrrh was one of the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus Christ, gold, frankincense, myrrh. It was symbolic of the death that he came to die. That's why he was born. He came to die. That myrrh represented that. So myrrh was used to embalm dead bodies. But before it could be used in perfume or embalming, this myrrh that was dried out had to be crushed into powder. And people will say that it was not until that myrrh was crushed that it actually released the strength of its aroma. I mean, you could smell it, but when you crushed it, man, could you smell it. That's when you knew it was myrrh. In fact, there are records of uh, people who used myrrh and who processed myrrh, and they said basically, once it was crushed into powder, you would look at the powder, you couldn't tell it was myrrh except for the smell. It's the smell that gave it away. It was that aroma that came up from it, but it wouldn't give that off until it was crushed. Now, in Myrrh, we find a perfect picture of the persecution of Christ's church. This is the persecuted church, the suffering church in the city of Myrrh. They're being crushed, but Christ has no condemnation for them because they're giving off the aroma of Jesus Christ as they're being crushed. In our age, we exist in comfort and ease. We go to church, we do our stuff, we go to work, we go home. We really don't have persecution in our lives. And as we'll see, the church at Laodicea is a great example of where we are in history and the way the church as a whole operates and exists. Lukewarm, just kind of existing. Not really doing a whole lot. Not giving off the aroma of Jesus Christ because we're too busy with other stuff. 
It's when persecution comes that the aroma of Jesus Christ actually starts to come out from true believers. It's in persecution that the full character of Christ is seen in us, or that the absence of Christ is seen in us as what comes out when we're shaken and crushed. Now, I've given you this example before. If you fill a cup up with orange juice, and I can hold it up here and go, this is water, this is water, this is water, this is water, and then I shake it, you get to see what it really is when I shake it. Or if I crush the cup and it spills all over, you go, oh, that's orange juice. And as believers, we can say, yeah, I love God, I'm a believer, I'll be faithful, and we can talk until we're blue in the face, but it's not until persecution comes and we're crushed under that weight that what's inside will really come out. And Jesus says that's what's happening in the church of Smyrna. But is it going to happen in your life? When you get under the persecution and you're crushed, what will come out? Complaining? Self-preservation? Fear? Or dependence on Jesus Christ and the character of His love, no matter how people treat you. Our perseverance through extreme persecution and trial, even to the point of death, demonstrates the presence and the strength and the glory of God in our lives. It's persecution that brings out what we really are. It's persecution that causes the church to really give off the aroma of Jesus Christ. Because that's all we're left with at that point. Jesus is not giving them a hypothetical situation. This is a real church, real people, and what he said was going to happen did happen. In fact, I'm going to share with you the story of a man named Polycarp. You probably have heard his name. If you're not familiar with him, let me give you some of the details. Polycarp was one of the elders of the church in Smyrna. And he was raised as a believer he became a personal disciple of the Apostle John. He learned at his feet directly from John himself. So he understood this message. In fact, some speculate that it was actually Polycarp who was at Patmos with John receiving this letter to bring back to the church at Smyrna. We don't know for sure, but it's possible because he was an elder in the church at Smyrna for a long time. And so Polycarp knew this message that Christ just gave to this church. At 90 years of age, roughly, he was dragged out of his home and brought to the arena to be tried by the Roman consul. And as the proconsul urged him to renounce Christ so that he could save his life, he said this, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he, he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? He was condemned then to be burned at the stake. And remember how Jesus said the Jews, which say they are Jews, but they're the synagogue of Satan? It was the Jews, actually, that were most diligent in gathering the wood and oil to pile around him to burn him to death. And it was the Sabbath day. Christ was right. They were a bunch of hypocrites. They lit the fire, and as the fire began to build in intensity, rather than igniting his clothes and burning him up, it actually formed a great arch around Polycarp. This is uh, recorded by witnesses to the event. And it says, the, more, the hotter it got, the more Polycarp's body and skin glowed as if it was gold and silver in a furnace. And finally, when the proconsul realized that the fire wasn't going to consume him, he ordered one of his soldiers to run him through with a dagger so that he would be killed. Faithful unto death. Christ says in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. To those who persevere, I will give thee a crown of life. And so the end of verse 10, I will give 10. I will give thee a crown of life. To those who overcome, you will not taste the second death. The crown that he's talking about at the end of verse 10 is the laurel wreath. You remember, if you know anything about the Olympics, the winners of each event would receive this crown. It was a 
a wreath of laurel leaves that they would put on their head. And it was the greatest honor not just to receive that crown, but then they would take that crown and present it to the emperor in honor to him. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you a crown of life, that reward. Now, as we study Revelation, we're going to see that at the end of time, we're going to cast our crowns at his feet. Those rewards that we've received for persevering, even in the face of tribulation. James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Paul talked about it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. He's at the end of his life, and he tells Timothy, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto them that also love his appearing. The crown of life. Eternal life is that reward given to all those who persevere in faith through this life, no matter how hard it might get. Now, all through Scripture, you can read about those who endure to the end shall be saved. And here it is, right from Jesus Christ's mouth. If you endure, if you persevere, you will receive the crown of life. Why do you think Jesus presented himself as the one who was dead and is alive? Because he's telling these people, you're going to die. But you're not going to stay dead. Because I'm not dead. Because I'm alive, I have the power to give you true life. And all you have to do is continue to be faithful and persevere no matter how hard it gets. And that is the mark of true life in a believer. And to those, they will receive that crown. And if Jesus died and is now alive, then it's guaranteed that he can keep us from this second death, which is the eternal suffering in hell. As Polycarp was threatened with the fire, if he didn't recant his faith, he responded to the proconsul with these words. Thou threatens me with fire, which burns for an hour, and after a little while is extinguished. But thou art ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of the eternal pun punishment reserved for the ungodly. I think Polycarp probably memorized this letter because that was the substance of his life. He was faithful even unto death. He persevered through the most extreme circumstances. We already read all those who deny Jesus. He says, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Those who denied Jesus even though they may have been part of the church, did not receive the crown of life. Here's the question. Do you have that overcoming faith in Jesus Christ? Will you persevere in the face of persecution and even in the face of death and be faithful to Jesus Christ? That's the true test. When you're crushed, will you give off the aroma of Jesus Christ or will you give off the stench of self-preservation and selfishness and complaining? See, so we have no idea how fast this world is going to change around us. We see leaps and bounds being made toward evil in our country, in our government, in people's lives, in our society. Today we sit here and we worship freely. This may not be possible a year from now, I don't know. It could be a, a crime to me like this and talk about the Lord and Jesus. And it's not if persecution is going to come, it's when it's going to come and how much. It is coming. And if we can't stand up even to somebody making fun of us because we're a Christian and we have to explain it away, what are we going to do when the real persecution comes? Is your faith in Christ enough to help you to overcome, to be faithful, even unto death? That's what Christ is saying, be faithful unto death. If you persevere, you will receive that crown of life. 
We have a faithful Savior in Jesus Christ who can preserve us, who can deliver us. No matter how bad it gets on this earth, we will be delivered to be with him in heaven. And that's not to be compared at all to what is here. This is nothing. But the question is, is your faith in Christ enough to help you to overcome, to continue to be faithful, even if you face death? May we always be faithful unto him, no matter what our circumstances, no matter how good or bad things are in our life. The test is, do we give off that aroma of Christ? And what will we give off when we are crushed? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We know that all that you tell us is true and the admonition that we've heard today is for us. Lord, we can't foresee the persecution that's going to come in our lives as believers today. We have no idea what will be brought against churches and against followers of you in the coming days. And really, that doesn't matter. We don't need to know. All that we need to know is that you will deliver us from it. We may be made fun of. We may be reviled. We may be put in prison. We may be even put to death. But you have told us, be faithful even unto death. So, Lord, please help us to be faithful. Help us to put so much confidence in you that we need nothing else. That we care more about you that we don't even care about preserving our lives, if that is your will. Because we know you're in control and you will do what's best. But, Lord, please give us the strength to be faithful. Help us to trust you, to rely on you, to see you as a God big enough to take care of everything about us because you do know as you promised. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you will never forsake us, and that you are always there, and that we can count on. And we praise you and thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.